What I learned in the debate last night is that if ever I am sick, if ever I am feeling or something, and I go to a doctor, I, know, but it was I want the doctor to do two things. I want the doctor to diagnose what's making me sick, but I also want the doctor to have the remedy. And yesterday, what we heard is the Secretary of State show clearly that it's not just about diagnosing and, and pointing out the problem, but coming up with the remedy and the solution. And she did a great job, right? And here in the Bronx, we know a little bit about that, because over the last six years alone, working with the elected officials, working with so many, so many community leaders, with so many of you, we've been able to turn, turn it around here. Over the last six years alone on economic development, we've seen almost $10 billion private dollars invested in our borough. We've seen 54 million square feet of development, over 24,000 units of housing, all built in a sustainable league way. We've seen unemployment go from 14.2% to 6.5%. In other words, over 100,000 more Bronx sites are working today than they were the first day that I took office. And we did all of that, ladies and gentlemen. Working together, we did all of that with democratic values. We did all of that with friends like Secretary Hillary Clinton. We all work together to look at the problem, but come up with a solution. And so we also did it because we understand and we celebrate our diversity. We're not here in New York people who want to build walls, we want to build bridges. Here in our borough of the Bronx, we have 1.4 million residents. 40% of the people who live here were born in another country.
This is a credit to each of you because you become an essential part of the fabric that makes America so great. We become a successful and thriving community. We become a voice. We become a source of power and influence. The Albanian community has become an example of the American dream and is making its mark in the U.S. and the world. So let's see if I can get a little excitement in here today. When I say, you say, Oye, Oye. Oye, Oye. Next Tuesday, just four days from now, is an important day. It's a day that we send a clear message that this election is important for the Bronx and for New York, for the country, for Albanians, and for all of us, and we can't afford to get it wrong. We need to elect someone that has a proven track record. We need a president that is experienced in international affairs. We need a strong leader with values that can make decisions. We need to elect the right man for the job. And in this case, the right man for the job is a woman. And that woman is Hillary Clinton. So on Tuesday, April 19, what are you going to do? Vote! What are you going to do? So this Tuesday, our choice is who? And after that, we're taking this campaign to the White House. Who we want for? Who we want for? Now we have a lot of friends, and the next person I'll introduce is a dear friend to all of us. We have my dear friend, your friend, someone that works hard for you day in and day out in Washington. My dear friend, Congressman Ellen Engel. Let's millions upon millions of dollars home to New York 
She was one of the most hard-working and effective members of the United States Senate. And she is someone who has really made us proud. So we want to take Hillary's effectiveness for the state of New York and use it for all of the United States of America. And I know with Hillary Clinton, we will have one of the best presidents the United States has ever had in the history of the country. Hillary is smart, she's hardworking, she cares about people, and what could be a better combination? But it's very important that you remember that in four days from now, you need to go to the polls and vote and bring your friends, because a lot of people do not realize that there is an election going on, a primary election going on. Many people think, well, I'll just wait till November and I'll vote for president. But that's not going to do it. We want to make sure the Democratic Party has the right nominee. We want to make sure that the Democratic Party has the winning nominee. And let me tell you, I was at the debate last night and I thought Hillary was just terrific. Didn't you? Yeah. So turnout, turnout, turnout is very important. So again, please make sure you not only vote, but that you bring your spouse. So you bring your brothers and sisters, you bring your friends, you bring your neighbors. We have to make sure that New York goes strongly for Hillary, and that will happen if you all go out and do that. Now, one last thing before I have a special introduction. Those of my friends, Albanian American friends, my Kosovo friends, know what we went through back in 1999. In 1999, there was a carrying out of genocide against the Albanian people in Kosovo. And we know that what was happening with the Serbs, they were moving along and doing all kinds of terrible things in the Balkans, and Kosovo was really about to get hit. And we don't know what would have happened. People would have been killed, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people. We know that people were driven from their homes. And the Albanian community in Kosovo looked for the world to help. And for a while it appeared that nobody was going to be there to help them. But there was one person who was there to help. And one person who made the difference for the nation of Kosovo. And that person at the time was President of the United States, President Bill Clinton. they named the street after me. But in the main city, the capital city of Pristina, they very fittingly named the street after President Clinton. So there is a great street, the biggest street, which is President Bill Clinton's street, along with a terrific statue. But when you see President Clinton, you will see that he's much better looking than that statue. <laughs> but, when I spoke to the president during this terrible period in 1999, I remember one thing the president said to me. I said, we cannot abandon these people. And the president looked at me and said, don't worry, we're not abandoning them. And when he said that to me, I went home and I rested comfortably because I know that he, I knew then he would not allow genocide to happen once again on, in the continent of Europe. And so when you look at people who saved Albanians, look no further than President Bill Clinton. Yeah. When you look at a who really cares about people, who made a difference for people, there would not be an independent nation of Kosovo today if it wasn't for President Bill Clinton. And I know that because I know how hard he worked for that. So it really just gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a wonderful, wonderful president of the United States. And by the way, I want to tell you, just before he comes out, that Hillary Clinton will do the same types of things that President Bill Clinton did when it comes to the Balkans, when it comes to caring about people, when it comes to making sure our lives are saved. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to all of you the person we've all been waiting for, our wonderful president.
Council Member Jeffrey Gonzalez, thank you. Council Member Andrew Cohen, thank you. And the President of the College of Mount St. Vincent, Charles Flynn, thank you for having us here. Thanks for all the students. You know, first of all, I'm embarrassed to admit that I have been living in New York for many years and I have been campaigning in New York for longer and I thought I knew more about New York than the average New Yorker, much less the average American. I have never been to this campus before. It is so beautiful. <laughs>
New York City resident, African American. And the guy said, are you the person who switched? He said, yes. And how'd you switch? He said, I was not for Hillary when I came here, but I am now because I thought her opponent was more focused on relitigating the past, and she was more interested in building the future, and that's what we have to do as Americans. So, uh, so, look, the work I did to save Kosovo from a genocide, and the work, the fact that we were able to get our allies to move quickly, was really important to me. Because I worked for two and a half years to do the same thing for the Bosnian Muslims. And I had enormous support every way from the Pope to the King of Saudi Arabia asking us to help save the Bosnian Muslims. And still our allies in Europe were reluctant. I just celebrated the 20th anniversary, celebrated is wrong observed, of the beginning and the end of the Bosnian conflict and the peace process triggered by the slaughter at Srebrenica. But I want to just say this to sort of solemnize and make real what I said about inclusive economics, inclusive societies, inclusive politics. So when we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the killing at Srebrenica, which ended the Bosnian conflict and started the peace process. We did it in this old building where a lot of the young boys were killed. And the mayor of Srebrenica, 36 years old, stood up and said this. I want you to think about it when we yell at our neighbors and our fellow Americans. It's not even think about it. This, this man said, I am the accidental survivor. I am the only male in my family who survived. I am the only member of my class at school who survived at 16. I have no idea why they did not find me in the woods. I am it, the accidental survivor. So, he said, I thought I should try to do something useful with my life, as if there was some reason that I had survived. And we had to begin again. He had invited the 39-year-old Prime Minister of Serbia to come, because he was trying to get the Serbians to move away from their ultra-nationalist dark path and take a different future. At first, the people didn't know what to do. But they said, look, oh, this guy lost his father. His father's, he's the only surviving member of his class. Maybe we should listen to him. He's acting like Nelson Mandela. He's only 36 years old. He said, you should make him feel welcome. You think it wasn't risky for him to come down here? You think he wasn't afraid after what they, his people did to us to come? But he came. We have to make a new beginning. That's what I want to say to all of you. Look at all these people all around the world. Only thing that matters is our differences. Only thing that matters is whether we can get our crowd to stop thinking so we can demonize their crowd, whoever they are. The future belongs to people who continually expand the definition of us and shrink the definition of us. Share prosperity and share 
societies and a shared political future. Two, in a troubled world that's more divided than it used to be, she has a proven record and the best ability to make sure that we try to stop all these problems from ripping Europe and the Middle East and the rest of the world apart so that it doesn't also, for Americans, drive down the economic recovery we have just started. You can't divide clearly the job of the next president into domestic and foreign policy. Look around this room. Is this a domestic or a foreign policy speech I've been for it? This is great. You can't do that. You have to be able to relate to and build the world as well as deal with the challenges here at home. And three, in 45 years of trying to help people live their dreams and solve their problems, of all the people I've ever worked with, she's the best change maker. And there's a lot of difference between talking about change and making it. And I think I told Hillary the other day that I said it just hit me one day. Your strongest supporters are the people who know you best and have worked with you longest. That's true. That's a pretty good recommendation. And that is a very significant difference in this race. Not everything that sounds good is good. Not everything that sounds good can be done. But this country has proved over a very long period of time that we have a continuing ability to reinvent ourselves, to make every new change and every new challenge our friend, not our enemy. The real reason there's so much anxiety today is that whenever there is a massive financial crash like the world endured in 2008, no nation has recovered from it fully for 400 years in less than 10 years. Not once. We got the jobs back in seven and a half years, but there's still yawning inequality because we have not gotten the wage increases and income increases back. Aggravated by the fact that the cost of college in many places and other kinds of training programs have kept people from getting the kinds of preparations that would make them competitive. And aggravated by the fact that we have not make the investments we need to modernize our infrastructure. Flint, Michigan's not the only place with too much slanted pipes that have elevated lead levels in the bloods of our children. If you tore up all those pipes, you create a lot of jobs and give every child a healthy future. We should do that. And it's complicated by the fact that too many corporations in America today are spending 80 to 90 percent of their revenues, their profits, are giving them to their shareholders and their chief top executives instead of to the workers in the places where they work. But the question about all this is what are you going to do about it? She's the first candidate to say, look, what we need to do now, we have solved the problem that caused the last crash. The Dodd-Frank bill, which President Obama signed, is working. There are 50,000 fewer people working on Wall Street today than there were the day before the crash. An article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, hardly the Democrats' last best friend, saying that these banks are making more conventional loans and fewer gambles. It's working. We just got to keep working it. The big problem today is that any company which sells shares to the general public is vulnerable to being dominated and distorted by these activist shareholders who want all their money plus the profit back in a year and a day. And they are trying to pressure company after company after company to give 80 to 90 percent of their money to the shareholders and the top managers because they get paid based on the share price. That's wrong. For the history of American business and business law was very different until recently. Until recently, corporations knew they had equal responsibilities to their customers, to their employees, 
to their communities, and to their shareholders. And the companies that live by that rule still do better. They still do better. There are now companies called B Corp, maybe some of the students here have studied them, who make a commitment to a sustainable, balanced future. Sustainable with the environment, sustainable with their communities, sustainable with their employees, good for their customers, and then good for their shareholders. Guess what? Over any five-year period, those companies do better. So we are being held out back by one of the primary drivers of inequality that nobody's asked about yet in any of these debates. And that is the demand for quarterly profits and capitalism when nobody with any sense believes you can build a great business unless you have a five or 10 year horizon in which you take care of the people who work for you because they're the most important asset you have. replenishing the workforce and our future, which is why Hillary has been such a strong advocate of immigration reform. And it doesn't matter where you came here from. There are now 11 and a half million undocumented people in this country. Most of them are going to school or working. The suggestion by the leading candidate on the other side that he's going to send everybody home is not only unethical, it's the dumbest economic idea I've ever heard in my life. Let's support what the president did with DACA and DACA, leave the kids in school and leave their parents alone and pass immigration reform and put people on a path to citizenship that doesn't have them jumping ahead of people who waited in line according to the rules, but lets them know that they are welcome in America as long as they are law-abiding and they love their kids and they're trying to make a positive contribution to this country. I'm telling you, if I were 25 again, and what would I like to be? And I had this magical experience where somebody brings me one of these magic lamps and a genie comes out of the lamp and says, I'll give you one wish, here it is. You can decide where you want to live 25 years from now. But you must decide right now. If at 25 I had known what I now know, I would pick the United States in a heartbeat. Because of you, look at this because of you. in a Catholic university, an event organized by Albanian Americans, and invite all the students, and it looks like you got the UN. <laughs> no place else. No place else. So all I can tell you is, this is our future, you. And if we need immigration reform. It's one of the big differences. We had a chance to get it in 2007, and 16 million people, the undocumented and their loved ones who are here with proper documentation, would be living better, more peaceful, more productive lives today if we had adopted it then. Because for all my differences with him, President George W. Bush was not afraid of immigrants. He was not trying to divide America by their immigration status. And he said, if you pass this bill, I will sign it. The farm workers were begging at society. All the immigration people. There's only one person running for president left in either party that voted for that bill. Hillary. It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Right thing to do. Right. So, I hope you will think about that. Let me just say a word about access to higher education. That was a pretty good part of the debate last night, but I'm not sure that anybody fully understand what happened. When I had the honor to serve, we had the biggest college aid program since the GI Bill. Ten million more young people got aid. Everybody got a 20% tax credit. 
For anything that didn't hire education after the first two years, that we gave basically tuition aid for the first two years. Within about five years, the benefits were gone from inflation. We had the first program to let people pay loans back as a percent of their income. But it only went to colleges and universities that issued loans and wanted to do that. Then when President Obama came in, he had an even bigger program, and all federal loans carried the option of paying it back as a percent of your income. And pretty soon the benefits of that have happened. Why? Because the cost of higher education all over America kept going up, and for the public schools, the government's contribution went down because of the crash, the politics of many state legislatures, and the need to fund growing public school population. So, everybody's been talking about it. Here's why I think Hillary's program is the best. It's better. Number one, she wants to make it possible for aid to flow to students, not just in public institutions of higher education, but also in private ones that have a lot of first and second generation immigrants, African Americans, Hispanics, working people on modest income, with reasonable tuition and high graduation rates. You should include the private schools too, like this one. That's an important difference. Secondly, she believes that the people who need free tuition should get it. That the people with lower incomes should get a much bigger increase in the Pell Grants so it covers not only supplies but living expenses. She believes, I have a feeling it's about to get less popular. She believes that, that every school should have a huge allocation of work study positions, so anybody who needs more money should get 10 hours a week for work study opportunity. Yeah, the truth is, the reason that's important is it's about the only thing the federal government can do to help colleges and universities hold their costs down. When you have a lot of students doing work study, that helps. One of the highest impact, lowest cost private schools in America is Berea College in Kentucky, where 100% of the people are on financial aid, 100% of the people work in the schools. It was founded before the Civil War in Kentucky, fully open to women and to African Americans way back in 1855. But they've still got the same problem. It's democracy, small d. Empower students to get their education and to minimize the cost and maximize the quality of education. We need to have a plan that would do that for everybody. She doesn't favor paying for the tuition of higher income people because she thinks when higher income people pay higher taxes, you should use that money to invest in new infrastructure, new clean energy, new jobs that will be created for middle class people when they get to education. I think it's a better argument. I also think it's unrealistic to think that one third of the cost will be deferred by state legislatures that have run against spending money on college and run in favor of cutting taxes. So we don't want to have a college loan program that only helps people who are lucky enough to live in states that A, have Democratic governors and Democratic legislators, and B, are not virtually broke. Look, New York's had a hard time. We're celebrating now the fact that the governor of the New York legislature finally had enough money to increase funding for the state university and the city university system. I have all the money. I thank you. But it would be very hard for them over and above that to come up with a third of the cost of free tuition for every single student. So I think Hillary's plan will work better. Here's the more important thing for students who already have debt. I don't know how many times I've heard this story, but the other night I was over seeing my granddaughter. And, uh, and my daughter and Hillary were out campaigning, so I went to see my son-in-law, and we were babysitting. And on the way home, I did what I tried to do often in other towns. 
I stopped in a little coffee shop. And this young African American woman was serving coffee. There's always some young person giving you coffee, especially if it's also a coffee shop. And I had a conversation with her. I tried to have every word. Here's the conversation. How long have you had this job? Five years. On and off. Well, what's off? She smiles. When I'm going to college, I said, what's on? She says, when I have to come out here and work and pay my debts off. So hopefully I can go back to college. It's already five years. She hadn't got a degree. Are you living at home? She said, yes, my mother doesn't make enough money to help me, but at least I can free rent. Otherwise, I could never pay back my debt. This is a big story in America. Anybody know anybody like that? It is a big story in America. So, so we talked about it. And then, like two days later, I went to buy a pair of jeans from a lady in Mount Cristo, New York. I've done a lot of business with over the years. And I knew she had a son who just graduated from one of the city colleges. And I said, how's your son doing? Great. He's going to get a good job, and I'm so proud of him. I said, does he have any student debt? Part of it, she said. I said, what's the interest rate? Nine percent. I said, do you have a home mortgage? She said, sure, I do. Did you refinance it? Of course I did. What's your interest rate? Less than four percent. This is crazy. A college loan is the only loan in the United States that you cannot refinance. Did you know that? Every other kind of loan you can refinance. So what does Hillary want to do about it? First, let everybody refinance. If you can do that, you can refinance. If we did just that, overnight, 25 million young Americans would save an average of more than $2,000 a piece just by refinancing. Then, since a college education, no less than a home, is a lifetime asset, and you can get a 20 to 30 year mortgage on your home, she proposes to give college students the option, no matter how much they borrow from whatever source, the option to turn it into a mortgage. 20 years at a fixed rate that never, never can exceed more than 10% of your after tax income. Now think about what that would mean. I mean, if you borrowed two hundred thousand dollars, get on the Think about what that would mean. You could move out of your parents' house. You could. You could take on a lower-paying job that you love better because the payment would go down with the salary. You could go to the bank and borrow money to start a small business. You always need the party, and your debt wouldn't count against your credit score because it will be a fixed percentage of your income, and if you start the business and you don't make any money the first year, it's okay, your payment will go down. This could liberate millions of people to contribute to our economy so we could reduce inequality and we could all rise together. It would be a very big thing to do. So, but the last thing I want to say is this, I don't want to keep you out there, it's a beautiful day. In the end, being president is a doing job. There's a reason it's called the chief executive. And she's the best doer I've ever known. And she was when I first met her. But I really sympathize with a lot of these young people who are, you know, excited about being told that there is one explanation for the misery of America and that is the greed of the Wall Street banks. But the truth is, Wall Street is smaller, and New York City is growing like crazy, led by the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in Queens, and entrepreneurs in New York, that are in Manhattan, that are diversifying the income. Right? So, what are we gonna do about this? And the thing that always struck me about Hillary is that she was just saying, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? About the only thing that disappointed me about that debate last night was the sneering reference that her opponent made to the mammoth victory she won in the South. Oh, this is the South. 
Yeah. <laughs> we know how conservative. Well, excuse me, but Democrats need to win Florida and North Carolina to get elected, and they are not. They are states of the future, highly diverse. And she won a big victory there. She won in Mississippi partly because they have a mayor in Jacksonville, an African-American guy, who is the embodiment of the future who helped him. She won in Alabama, 93% of the African-American vote and a majority of the white vote because when she was a young woman, this is one reason, she went to Alabama for the Children's Defense Fund to help shut down private segregated academies that were pretending to be 